Our next speaker is uh, Gary Gensler. Gary uh, joined Sloan uh, School recently, and he has been working with multiple groups around MIT, CSAIL, Media Lab, and he'll talk to us about uh, developments in FinTech. Um, thank you. I'm going to start with uh, first a thank you to MIT, because I'm recently to MIT. You all went to MIT undergrad. I didn't. That was my own error when I was a 17-year-old. But a thank you to uh, the leadership uh, through Dave and Ezra, who run Sloan, Joey Ito, who run uh, the Media Lab, that invited me to be part of the faculty and, and, and so forth. Um, it's been an incredibly welcoming community, all the way to a dinner last night that, that was arranged with 10 or 12 of you. Uh, it's always been welcoming. Secondly is a little bit of an admission. It's a little daunting to present here in front of 100 or so MIT grads, but also Bob Merton has already presented today. Uh, I have a couple of my bosses. Dave is my boss. He's the dean. Leonid runs the finance group, and while I'm not in the finance group, I kind of attend their Monday and Wednesday uh, sessions, so I feel affiliated. And my former boss, John Thane. John and I were partners together at Goldman Sachs. So that's an admission. High stakes for me, maybe. Um, thirdly is a thought experiment. Just if you could, all of you, it's been 11 years since the crisis. Let's go to 2030. And my thought experiment is, if each of you can think of the one thing that is most likely to be disrupted in finance by technology. So it's been 11 years. Jump to 2030. I'm going to give you a lot of context. I'm going to use a slide deck. I'm going to give you a presentation. But right now, before the presentation, 2030, when millennials are ages 30 to 50. That's kind of what that year is, 2030. What do you think that area of finance is going to be most disrupted by technology between now and then? At the end, we'll see you know, whether I've changed any opinions or things like that. So that's just a kind of thought thing. Um, oh, well, an, another master slide. So this is what I'm going to try to cover. Finance and financial technology, it's just a little quick thought of what FinTech is or maybe isn't. Um, I'm going to choose to dive into two areas that I'm spending most of my time, <coughs> both blockchain technology and AI, machine learning, deep learning. Uh, I've been welcomed by Andy Lowe and Sylvia McCalley and Safi uh, over to be a co-director of FinTech at the Computer Science and AI Lab, so I spent a lot of time around that. And I teach and have stood up with Antoinette and Leonid and others a bunch of crypto and blockchain courses. Um, but I think those are two relevant areas. A little note on payments, a little sort of visual on who the FinTech actors are, just for s sort of some fun. And because I'm kind of a former regulator, of, if we have time, a, a note on public policy frameworks. So a lot to cover. Trying to do it in like 25 minutes or less to leave 10 minutes for questions. So what's the financial sector? The financial sector basically moves, allocates, and prices money at risk. When I was at Goldman Sachs for 18 years, we always said risk was our friend. Well, it is within certain parameters. You get to swan events. It wasn't, but it aggregates risk. But it basically moves, allocates, and prices two things in an economy, money and risk. And it is long had a symbiotic relationship with technology. So just to walk down memory lane, FinTech of earlier years. Now, the Financial Stability Board that I've been honored to sort of participate in as a regulator and honored since I've been at MIT to actually advise a little. They invite me with the MIT brand. It's great, by the way, having an MIT brand. Um, they define FinTech as a technology that has the potential to make a material change in business models in finance. So the telephone is no longer a fintech, but the telephone was a fintech maybe in the 1920s when the New York Stock Exchange that John once led. But the New York Stock Exchange in the 1920s had to debate whether to allow telephones on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. But it's no longer a fintech. Maybe it was in the 20s. Um, so the early years. Ledgers were a form of fintech, all the way back to, to that numbers maybe came before written words. 
money. Money is a social construct, and as we debate Bitcoin today, but we wouldn't call money fintech, even though, in a sense, it was a technology and is a technology and a social construct. Credit cards. My favorite, it was first written about in a book in 1887, a book about the future of the year 2000. Uh, but credit cards. So it's just sort of a little memory walk down lane. Um, uh, so I've gotten everybody's attention. So that's fintech of earlier years. Why does fintech have a possibility? Why does technology have a possibility? Well, I think finance has a bunch of characteristics. We've won, we've dematerialized things of value. I'm not talking about what you can buy at Sotheby's. I'm talking about stocks, bonds, options, equities, money. We basically dematerialize it. When I'm in a classroom, I say, your children, to the students, your children will not recognize a Federal Reserve note. Now, I mean, I'm hoping their children aren't in the kind of the drug trade or something. <laughs> but, but I think 20 years from now, 30 years from now, I'll say most people will not recognize coins and, and physical notes. We've dematerialized money, vast amount of data. It's thought that something like 90% of all the data in the world that's stored digitally today was created in the last 12 to 18 months. And this is true every kind of two years. Uh, roughly speaking, it grows so rapidly. And the expansion of computer power. Those are the big three, I would say. But of also, finance relies on ledgers. Finance uh, uh, right now is welcoming in the millennial generation that in 2030, remember, are going to be 30 years old to 50 years old. I mean, they'll be running most of, of the economy. Um, and so these are kind of the things that I think about why it's such fertile ground. What's its potential? And this is sort of Gary Gensler's list, but what's its potential? First, it's on the customer side. Four bullet points, but the customer side being basically all the UI, the user interface is changing dramatically. It's changing dramatically as we move to mobile phones, but it's changing dramatically for a bunch of other reasons as well. Robo-advising. Uh, and how do we move forward with that? Greater financial inclusion. In Sub-Saharan Africa right now, half of Sub-Saharan Africa still is unbanked by World Bank statistics, but half of that half have mobile phones, even though they're unbanked. And so why has M-Pesa been so successful? Uh, started by a, a telecom company, Safaricom in Kenya, uh, as a payments vehicle in Kenya and throughout uh, East Africa. Peer-to-peer -peer services. We're going to come back to this because we're going to see how you rank these. I'll put this slide up at the very end of my talk as well. And then something called the Internet of Value. Moving around on the Internet, packets of data representing value, the same way we move packets of data around the Internet since the early 1990s on the Internet, and the internet is not an intranet. In the early 90s, we had CompuServe and other services that were intranets. And then the internet comes along because great MIT work, World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee and so forth, creating an internet. Will we get to a place where we have a true internet moving money around, packets of value, interoperable movement, of value and micropayments. That's the dream of part of the blockchain community. Will it, will it be achieved or not? Uh, a second group is sort of inside the firms, how the firms actually manage themselves using artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and the like to better manage risk, whether it's credit risk, trading risk, insurance risk, underwriting risk. I believe deeply that the pattern recognition that you can get out of deep learning Arguably, it's not that different than what I studied and you all studied back in school, regression analysis, linear algebra, a little bit matrix algebra. I stopped there. Dave, can I stay at MIT if I admit that? OK. But, uh, but you know, it's pattern recognition. But will it have a big difference in the middle of a firm? I think yes, in risk management. And I'm sure when John and I were at Goldman Sachs, we would have liked to have had some of that. And Arwin is probably using it now in what he does. Greater liquidity for less liquid assets. 
I'm not entirely sure. That's my own view. But some people think we can, we can digitize less liquid assets, maybe the art at Sotheby's even uh, that I mentioned. Shorter settlement cycles. Technology can certainly, we're now at T plus 2 in the equity markets. We were once at T plus 10 if you go long enough ago, and, which means you transact on a Monday and you settle on a Wednesday. It used to be Monday and settle on a week later or three days later. So these are things that can be streamlined inside the firms. And then lastly, in terms of the business models themselves, will revenue models shift similar to the data business that things are being provided for free? And we're going to talk later very quickly about two firms, Robinhood and uh, Credit Karma, that are completely free apps. And Robinhood has 6 million customers now. Um, and so, you know, will things shift? And will efficiencies and tighter margins address something that's persistent? Finance generally earns in the U.S. about 200 basis points, or 2% of the debt outstanding. What does that translate to? Finance today is 7.5% of our economy, 1.5 trillion U.S. dollars, because we have debt about 380% of our economy. But persistent decade after decade, finance has not really been prone to the kind of same efficiencies that you know, maybe the retail business Amazon is pressuring. So a question mark. I could have put a question mark on the end of that. So finance of our times that's hitting us, I put up eight. Some of those, in a sense, are like the telephone. Cloud computing, you might contend, well, that's been around for a while. Um, but actually, big finance has not adopted cloud computing as quickly as the rest of the economy, partly because of regulation, partly because of privacy concerns. Uh, does J.P. Morgan Chase want to put everything in a cloud or not? I would predict over the next 10 years more will go in, and the big systemic risk will be Microsoft Azure and Amazon Web Services. Uh, in addition to there'll still be systemic risk at J.P. Morgan Chase, because it's big. But uh, you can argue mobile, in a sense, is just like a telephone. But mobile has definitely changed a bunch. But I want to focus on artificial intelligence and blockchain technology, maybe because it's what I teach around. But I think it's also the things that are most are happening, changing uh, around those two. So what's artificial intelligence and machine learning? I, I do four circles. In essence, it's a, almost like those little dolls that you can get in, in Russia. You know, you got the big one, the little one, the next one. So uh, what, are, what are the words I would place with this? Artificial intelligence, and again, I apologize to any computer scientists in the room. <laughs> uh, machines capable of imitating our intelligence. And I choose the word imitating. It's not necessarily that they're humans. Um, but sort of imitating our intelligence. Machine learning, and this has been around in some of these vocabulary words shift over time, machines able to adjust or learn from the data, that the data basically informs the computer and the computer sort of learns from it. But then representational learning is inferring features and learning from the data, and then deep learning, which of course the theories of much of this has been around for four or five decades, but deep learning now really where the machines are learning using something called neural networks. And in the simplest sort of form is basically layers of looking for patterns. So if you have a picture and it's a bunch of pixels, you can't go from pixels directly to is this a stop sign or a speed limit sign uh, for, let's say, autonomous vehicles. You've got to kind of go through layers of pattern recognition, looking for edges, colors. Is it a sign? And by the way, how many of you in the last week have gone on to some website and it's asked you, can you push the boxes that say where the signs are or the cars, right? Do you know what we're all doing? We're training the computers to replace us. All right, all right, I'm just kind of kidding around. But it's true. 
So deep learning can be supervised learning or unsupervised learning. Supervised means there's labels on the features. And what we are all doing when you do that is you're helping give data to the data sets to label features. This is a sign. This is a stop sign and so forth. Um, it's an aside from the, the story about finance. But I kind of like that we're training the computers to take our jobs. Um, sorry about that. So I've, I've taken a slide from a colleague across campus, uh, uh, Lex Fridman, who does this wonderful open courseware for free MIT deep learning course. And if you ever want to just learn a little bit more, click on his site, learn from him. He's a re great research scientist. But deep learning in one slide, I love, love. What is it? Extracting useful patterns from data. Neural networks is this concept of having layered pattern recognition. Uh, what we use now is a bunch of programming languages. TensorFlow is interesting because it's created by Google, and it's a programming language basically to do deep learning. Um, and it's used by a whole mess of folks, both at MIT and elsewhere. Um, and the hardest thing is what is the question you're asking, and it's really hard to get good data. But if you get good data, you can clean it up, and you sort of frame your questions well, uh, uh, you're going to move it forward. Where is it most used? The progress, face recognition, voice recognition, speech recognition. You see sort of the general thing. And, and of course, we know that now the computers can be humans in not only the game of checkers, which was kind of done in the 1960s, or chess, which was by the late 90s, but now even the game of Go, which was in 2016 and 2017, using deep learning. But you don't see on this list finance yet, really. Now, finance is using deep learning, but not as deeply as Google and Facebook. Um, I mean, Google's even got TensorFlow. I mean, in a sense, I would contend big tech is ahead of big finance. A couple issues, because I'm a policy guy too, I throw out, and I, I, over at the Media Lab, I help in this little initiative called Ethics and Governance of AI. Um, so a couple issues, biases in it. Depending upon the data that you put in, you're going to get biases out. And AI and deep learning are used in the criminal justice system, and that's really sort of like kind of wrenching when you think about that sometimes. How do you get the error rates down? How do we move error rates lower than human error rates of judges in the criminal justice system? But deep learning and AI is also used for credit allocation. And the exciting part of it is we can move from those FICO scores that Antoinette was talking about earlier. Remember, she was saying subprime is here and prime is here and so forth. And we can use for, move further along. And we already know that. Alibaba, through their financial firm Ant Financial, and Tencent are definitely using cash flow data because in China they have the deepest pool of cash flow data because they are the payment rails. Over a billion people in China either pay through Alibaba's uh, payment system or, or WeChat Tencent's payment system. So they have a bunch of cash flow data, and they're creating and starting to do micro lending. And here in the US, who's doing it? Who do you think? Is it JP Morgan? It's Amazon. Amazon Prime, 33 million customers. They've started to loan and loan to small businesses, and also because they're seeing payment data, payment flows. You can enhance the underwriting decisions in that way. But the biases uh, start to you know, be a real issue. Another thing that we hear, and over at the FinTech at CSAL, we were able to fund, it's, it's a group of 12 uh, member companies that help fund it. It's, it's a club, if I can call it sort of a club, a sponsored research uh, arrangement, where that we uh, uh, ask the companies what they would like to have research on. We get ideas, we go to the research faculty, the research faculty said, I, we think we can do this. And then we kind of align those, uh, those wishes and those wonderful uh, researchers at the computer science lab. In that effort, about five of the efforts, uh, five of the 10 things that are funded are AI or machine learning related. Maybe three are blockchain related. One or two are, one's kind of a network project, and I can't remember the 10th. But the, 
this is one of the big issues is how do we explain the algorithms? How do we explain them to our customers? How do we explain them to regulators? How do we explain them if we get challenged in the media on our decisions? And that's not just finance, obviously, it's elsewhere too. Privacy, data ownership, jobs, which was a question that, that was earlier asked even about uh, innovation. Singularity is this idea is what happened when, you know, Hal takes over and it's, you know, it, you remember who Hal was, the computer, yeah. Um, but when Hal takes over. Um, blockchain technology. Um, I've had the honor to teach about 150 students this year in different, uh, Leonid and I have this course called Crypto Finance right now where we're trying to teach how to value crypto assets. I don't know how we're doing, Leonid. Uh, but, um, uh, MIT is a remarkable place. I would say probably somewhere on campus there's 200 to 250 students taking a course somewhere this academic year in blockchain technology. Either John Williams over in the electrical engineering group actually teaches some programming and Neha Narula and others and then over at Sloan we do our thing. Maybe it's 250. It's probably 500 to 1,000 that take machine learning classes and so forth. So I just want to you know, scale this stuff. But what is blockchain technology? It's an innovation at first from the early 1990s. Two Bell Lab scientists came up with the concept of doing blocks of data using a cryptographic thing called a hash function, a data <coughs> commitment, and connecting those blocks of data. It's kind of a clunky, harder data structure, but it has better tamper resistance. So you're trading off a little complexity with da data resistance with fingerprinting these blocks of data. In 2008, a paper is written by Satoshi Nakamoto. I have a question. Does anybody know who Satoshi Nakamoto is? <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you, I want to know because you're going to make news and we're going we're to live stream this. He's probably dead. He's probably dead. So do you know? You think it's Hal Finney. Is that it? Yeah. Nobody actually knows who Satoshi Nakamoto Well, maybe. Maybe uh, my former colleague at Goldman Sachs knows. But Satoshi Nakamoto uh, writes a paper on Halloween night, 2008, in the middle of the financial crisis. I can assure you that most people in finance did not read it at that point in time. But it was right in the middle of the crisis on Halloween and puts it out on a cypherpunk web uh, email list. And I use the word cypherpunk. It was a bunch of cryptographers. Um, but what what Nakamoto was uh, trying to achieve was a form of currency without a central authority. And at its core, he was trying to solve a riddle that was around for 20 years, and somewhere in the order of 30 to 50 efforts were done to try to do this. Even one or two patents were filed and failed. The idea was, can we move something of value on the internet like we move something of information on the internet, packets of data on the internet, can we move packets of data that represent money? That was at its core, with no central authority, with no central bank, no commercial bank. In essence, no central registry or ledger, but a distributed, decentralized ledger. And Nakamoto came up with what I'll call Nakamoto consensus, where it could be untrusted, broad consensus. And without going deeper on it, it you can create an auditable database that's tamper resistant. Don't get Confused, if somebody says it's immutable, nothing is immutable. Quantum computing could trample this. And well before that, something called 51% attacks can as well. But it's highly tamper resistant. Uh, and Bitcoin was its first use case. So what is blockchain? It provides peer-to-peer -peer alternative for computing and moving value. You can actually move value, but you could also store and do computing on it. <laughs> Ethereum was the, the sort of the next thing that did a bunch of computing on it. It can lower verification and networking costs. And one of our colleagues, Christian Connellini, has written extensively on how it can lower these types of costs of verification and networking. But it comes with complexity and it comes with real governance issues and challenges. So it's not like just you win, you also have to have a trade-off. Um, I think any use case really has to address purpose versus traditional databases. And what you're moving from in a traditional database is you're trusting Facebook or JP Morgan or the state government to keep your records. 
and you're trying to move from that, that kind of economics of trust to a different measure of trust. Um, incumbents largely are not looking at using Bitcoin or open permissionless blockchains. They're looking at using databases inspired by blockchain technology. And I'm not aware of any large financial institution is currently kind of changing something with a permissionless blockchain. But they're, they're inspired by it. And IBM has something like 1,500 employees dedicated to coming up with ideas for both finance and the Walmarts of the world to, to do that. Um, crypto finance markets are still rife with scams and frauds and the like. And I think adoption is five or 10 years away at best. So with that earlier 2030 question, I've revealed a little bit of what I think. I think that the money got through, thrown at this area before it was kind of fully ready. And so you think it's like if, if, if $30 billion or equivalent was, was thrown at the internet in the 1980s before Tim Berners-Lee came up with the World Wide Web, or maybe if it was thrown at it in the early 90s, before TSL and SSL, which was 1996, was the security protocols for the internet. Amazon started in 1995, eBay started in 95, just to give you a kind of you know, benchmark. But when did they really take off? And remember, you remember all, remember those slow modems where you, you, know, you had to wait three minutes and you couldn't get through and everything? This area has raised about $30 billion of capital. The worldwide venture capital raise per year is about 150 billion, so I'm just putting it in context. But the FinTech raise is running kind of 20 to 30 billion a year. So this raised as much in 18 months as all of FinTech. So something's going on in, in a sense. Um, so I think it will be a catalyst for change. It might not be the change agent itself, but I think it's spurring change at central banks and elsewhere. I couldn't talk about crypto without saying it's kind of a wild ride and in, in volatile market, $175 billion as of uh, this morning. Now, I don't know what it is later today. Um, it's kind of a small asset class. Worldwide asset classes, equities is 80 to 90 trillion. But it's, it's a very volatile, very interesting asset class uh, to sort of follow. And a lot of big financial firms, if their clients want in, they'll, they'll be there. So Fidelity and Goldman Sachs and others are kind of looking at it as it worthwhile to you know, have a desk and do something in this area. Over half of the value is in Bitcoin. Uh, and in fact, I think of five sectors. They're payment or, or you might call payment or speculative tokens like Bitcoin about two-thirds of this asset class, um, with Bitcoin being the biggest. Their platform tokens, you can almost think of the platform tokens, Ethereum and others, that that's like the operating system in your iPhone. Or Facebook operates almost like a platform. And one of our other MIT colleagues writes extensively on how platforms and applications on top work. All of these initial coin offerings that are done are kind of on top of, of them, and those add up to 12 or 18 billion. I've contended when I meet with some of the folks that run these platforms, even though they're decentralized, there's always somebody somewhere. Um, by the way, Bitcoin is on an MIT open source license, if you were wondering about it. Satoshi Nakamoto, when he put it on GitHub, used an MIT license but we don't know who Satoshi is. So these are the sort of areas. Um, wh what's being uh, thought about as possible uses, and I put potential uses. First, venture capital. About 25 billion was raised through initial coin offerings, so it's already been a little disruptive. I wouldn't contend 25 billion out of 150 billion raised is highly disruptive, but 25 billion was raised in the space. Payment systems. Can we do payments differently? Could we actually get to a place where you could have an internet of value moving money around the globe? Now it's harder because data was not as highly um, compartmentalized. National governments never really said, uh, with a couple key exceptions, 
let's partition the internet. China has done its efforts, other countries have, but by and large, you can move data around the globe and governments didn't say stop, uh, by and large. Uh, but here, we've layered over our money system in the last three to five decades, a whole legal and enforcement effort around anti-money laundering, know your customer, uh, sanctions regimes, tax enforcement, so that when we digitized money in the last 30 to 50 years, a bunch of other official sector folks wanted to kind of get into that sort of information flow uh, to express social and public policy. You might be for it or again it, but 180 countries probably do it. Um, Payment systems, World Bank estimates, is between a half a percent and one percent of GDP in almost every country. In the U.S., that means $100 billion to $200 billion a year. I think we could do better, and today's modern technology could. So you would say, would, would, should we short, with all respect, if there's anybody in the room, I'm just kind of having a little fun. I'm an academic now. But you sh should we short Visa and MasterCard? I don't know. But you, you, you might think about it. Stripe's market value is $22 billion now. Um, MasterCard probably has more patents in the blockchain space than any other company. I think it's about 36 or 37 patents. Are they warehousing those patents as a defensive ploy because they don't want anybody else to get in and they're, they're planning a legal? Or are they coming out with a big announcement? They even have a patent on fractional crypto banking but we haven't seen what they're going to do with any of it. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things that we could chat about, and I want to make sure we save time for Q&A. But I think that the biggest disruptor so far, and it's not really that big a disruptor, was the $25 billion raised in initial coin offerings. Um, payments, just a couple of, and it, I use the visuals just to say, PayPal kind of started uh, 1998. Uh, a sort of a failed effort up in, in Sweden was right with them, is to say, how do we disrupt this payment system because we have an internet? Now, in the U.S., we basically turned to the credit card rails. The internet comes along. The internet was incredibly disruptive in a sense, but here in the U.S., we just went with the credit card rails to solve an important electronic commerce issue. But credit card companies in the U.S. still charge about 25 to 3%. We'll call it 2.7%. I was the chief financial officer of the Hillary Clinton campaign, Hillary for America. And we raised, we spent, and we lost, I know, but we raised and spent a billion dollars. We probably spent 15 or $20 million on interchange charges for Visa and MasterCard and the like. Now, I don't mean that it would change the outcome of the election or anything, but Maybe not, maybe. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it, as a merchant, I feel the pain as a merchant because I was the CFO there. That, that, was a, that was a line item in a political campaign. It's a line item at Starbucks, and that's why Starbucks is partnering with Intercontinental Exchange, which is a large exchange operator that now owns the New York Stock Exchange. And why is the owner of the New York Stock Exchange partnering with Starbucks trying to create a payment system around Bitcoin, and they're also partnering with Microsoft, Azure. So big actors partnering together. Uh, interesting statistics from a WorldPay uh, uh, report is the use of e-wallets already worldwide is about 36% in e-commerce uh, uh, e payment methods, and point of sale about 16%, and you can see where they project it to go. Region by region, though, in Asia, it's much higher, and in North America, much lower, because Asia leapfrogged us, particularly in China and then subsequently in India, because the banking system and the credit card systems were not as developed in China and India. They basically leapfrogged around, and I would contend right now, I mean, you can, you can go anywhere in China and you, with a QR code, buy, and you get your... You, uh, you rarely see RMB. Um, so that's just kind of a, a couple of fun things. Who are the actors? And then a word on public policy and a few questions. Um, so big finance. I don't use the term fintech to just mean startups. 
Everybody in big finance, and I even decided to put Ant Financial up there because Ant Financial now has the world's largest money market fund in any jurisdiction. Uh, of course, all the startups, and I just grabbed a bunch of, of, of logos for the unicorns that we're going to chat about in a second, but also big tech. And in China, Alibaba, which if you want to think of kind of like, you know, Amazon, I mean, it's not you know, completely accurate, but Amazon here, Beidou, which kind of think like Google, China, and Tension, which is kind of like a messaging, a first messaging system, so WhatsApp or, you know, what Facebook purchased, um, they're fully into finance. They are fully in finance right now, already. Here in the U.S., though, Google and Apple all have Google Pay, Apple Pay. I wouldn't say they're dominantly in finance. They're kind of in the payment side. They're not quite in the credit. But Amazon now is into credit, totally providing credit to their shippers and so forth. So three sets of actors, big tech, big finance, which we'll call startups. And there's thousands of startups. I just picked the 30 or 35 that are unicorns. So who are the unicorns? And this will just populate to give you a sense where they are. These are billion dollar market cap or more as sort of generally looked at by various publications. <laughs> Payments, eight or 10 of them. I mean, some of you will know these names like TransferWise and so forth. Stripe, 22 billion market cap. Um, credit and lending, a bunch of them. Those are really the dominant area, but a couple in asset management, five in, 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 in trading and, and capital markets, three of which are in the crypto space, a uh, handful in insurance or benefits like Zenefits and Policy Bazaar. And there's one in China that kind of is all the way across. Now, I'm probably wrong. There might be five or 10 other unicorns being billion dollar market cap. But I just want to circle two. Credit Karma and Robinhood, neither of them charge any fees. There are zero revenue models. Robinhood, with their about six million customers, is an app you can download, and millennials love it. It's free, and I can open up a, a brokerage account within minutes, and I can trade. Now, Robinhood's revenue model is then they, as I understand it, sell payment for order flow and a number of very large uh, uh, high frequency traders buy that order flow. But to the customer, it's free. Credit Karma was initially to give you credit reporting, but now based on that, they're providing actual lending. But free. So will this change the revenue models of finance? Don't know. Public policy, protect the public, investor protection, consumer protection, financial stability, and guarding against illicit activity all still matter. I contend even when things change, it all still matters. Because we express our social desires through democracies in our parliaments and our legislators and our regulators. And so would we say just because there's, should we be technology neutral, which is generally the bias, or should we be pro new technology and say, well, they don't have to worry about this stuff. So there's a couple of different approaches. One is to say new activities just come within the frameworks and laws that we have. Oh, maybe we have to clarify around the edges where there's ambiguity. So that's kind of one camp. Another camp would be say, we need to adjust the requirements. And I'm not going to take a vote here. I'm just going to say these are kind of the different camps. When the internet came along in the, in the 1990s, we had to adjust. Folks were putting up bulletin boards on the internet and said, you can buy shares and sell shares on these bulletin boards. And the, uh, the, then the Securities and Exchange Commission under Arthur Levitt took a three-year process to decide, are these exchanges? And of course, probably the big exchanges like NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange were probably saying to the SEC, these look like exchanges. And they came up with a regulation that at the time was called exchange light or broker-dealer heavy. It's called broker-dealer alternative trading system in 1998. And it's 50 or 60 platforms are registered that way now. 
it was a, I, I think they took, they took that middle bucket approach. They adjusted the regulations uh, around the globe. There's also, can we give regulatory forbearance for early stage innovation through sandboxes? Uh, but don't be mistaken, that's sort of giving some forbearance. It's, it may be the right public policy to do it, but those are kind of the different buckets. The, uh, the uh, controller of the currency, the Office of the Controller of the Currency is tr kind of doing that a little bit with, with a FinTech license. So um, I'm back to the earlier slide just to, because I asked you, 2030, now you've heard my talk. Does anybody think, is it mostly on the customer facing side and greater inclusion? Is it mostly inside the firms, how they manage risk and provide liquidity and so forth? Or is it going to change the revenue, and, and, and are we going to go from 7.5% of the economy or less? My view is I think it's going to change some in all three of these things, 11 years. But I still think we'll have commercial banks. I don't think that we will get away from the network effect of taking deposits and making loans. Um, so I'm not in the camp that we will have this all disintermediated. But I think we'll have customer side, middle side, uh, being the management of the firms. And I think it will change. There will be some credit karmas and Robin Hoods that kind of take off. So any questions, however you want to do this. Great, thank you. We have a first question from the audience. What do you think of Tim Berners' latest idea of users controlling their own data and selling it individually? Can the genie ever be out back in the bottle? So. I think this is, it's a wonderful question. I don't know that it can be put back in the bottle for the following reason. Technology will give us the means to have a better way to control our data, which some people call self-sovereign identity. And you can do it either in a blockchain technology format or actually you, it's not clear you need blockchain technology. There's even technology that's starting to be worked on, and I've, I, there was an academic who presented uh, over at the Media Lab a week or two ago on this. On the next layer above self-sovereign identity, which you need to, how do you aggregate everybody? Self-sovereign identity means you control your data, and privacy is the ownership right of your data, and you only give it out to, wh to whom you want. But there's still a question when you give it out that it can't be, in essence, double spent. I give it to Dave, and then Dave wishes to give it to John. Yeah. There's actually technology being developed that if I give it to Dave, he can only kind of use it and he can't actually copy send it. I think commercial reality, though, is a little tricky. <laughs> I think commercial reality is uh, most people like getting free services or what appears to be free, even though we're in essence enabling it through data. So I love that Tim Berners-Lee has got that idea. I, I think that some portion of seven billion people will gravitate to it, um, but I think the genie's largely out of the bottle. Thank you. Sweet Green just announced today that it will begin accepting cash again after two years of banning cash transactions. What's your opinion on the increasing cashless economy and should brick and mortar businesses be required to accept cash? Um, I think cash is going the way, going like the way of the dodo bird. So over the next 20 or 40 years. Um, it is still legal tender, and that means if they hand you a cup of coffee in Starbucks, they have to take your cash. And the reason is, is because the cash is valid for all debts, public and private. And once you have your hand on the coffee, there's a debt. I'm not suggesting you go into court, but that's the way it is. If they don't hand you the cup of coffee, they have no legal obligation to hand you the coffee, though. But I like that Sweet Green is taking cash again, but it's swimming against the tide, is my opinion. Thank you. You mentioned that one of the largest motivations for Bitcoin and blockchain is no centralized authority. But similarly, you commented that institutions are mostly focusing on private permission systems. How do you remedy the difference in use cases, and what will the strongest value proposition of cryptocurrencies be? So it's an excellent question. I think that I don't even seek to um, 
rationalize that. I think that big finance has been inspired by this new data structure, and they're trying to find ways to lower the cost of their back offices and mutualize some back office costs. So I think that's probably directionally a good thing. Separately, the question of how do you think about the value proposition. There's three key questions. Do you need this data structure of a block, a data commitment, a block, a data commitment? It's a little clunkier. It's a little harder to search. Second question, and this is the harder, and then I get to the hardest is the third, is do you need consensus among multiple parties? Literally consensus. I have three daughters. For my three daughters to kind of con have a consensus on where we're taking vacation, they're all in their 20s, they have their own lives, that's a challenge. There's a hundred of you in this room if we had to have a consensus. It, it just, so governance is tough. You could create Uber or Lyft on top of a blockchain technology today. Uh, well, maybe in five years you could. It would be, have the performance. Uh, Sylvia McCallie's Algorand, uh, who's a uh, Turing Award winner at, at MIT that I work with. Um, Sylvia's got a great technology that has a performance you could create Uber on top of it. The question is then who would update the software? There's still the question who would update the software. Third question is do you need a native token? And the history of, of economics, the history of finance, tells us that we all gravitate for the network effects of multi-use currencies. That you can use it in Starbucks, you can use it for dinner, you get paid in it, it's a multi-use currency. How many of you are gamers? When well, nobody's gonna admit? We got one gamer, <laughs> right. So in, ga I don't know which game, it's all right. Usually if I ask at MIT, about a third of the hands go up, by the way. But in gaming sites, there are some single-use currencies. And you all tell me you have airline miles. That's not what I'm talking about, but that's a single-use currency in a sense. So there is some economies that use single-use currencies. And in gaming sites, they're called shields and skins and things, but um, so. Great, okay, last question. Last question. Why don't regulators regulate cryptocurrencies out of existence? Aren't oh. they mainly tax evasion and illegal activity conduits? All right. So. Crypto came along, at first nobody even knew it. The US Department, I'm just gonna use the US, but it's true around the globe. The first question is how to tax it. The US Department of Treasury between 2011 and 2013 figured that all out, and it's property. If you have a capital gain, you pay your capital gain, uh, and so forth. We're going through this period now where we're sort of settling down, are some of them securities and some of them not? But it's, it's not been, in really any country, the official sector's view that they've got to, what was the word, regulated out of existence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some say China has, but they didn't. In the fall of 2017, China said they, quote, banned initial coin offerings and they banned crypto exchanges. Before they did that, about 60% of the trading between Bitcoin and fiat currencies was Bitcoin versus RMB. And subsequently, it's usually 50 to 60 percent US dollars, Japanese yen, and so forth. So the, the, the Chinese authorities were basically trying to tamp down on RMB, Bitcoin cross, but they have capital controls. For most other countries, the regulators said, we're pulling it inside the regulatory perimeter. It's an asset for tax purposes. We're pulling it inside the anti-money laundering, I'll call it regulatory perimeter. Um, many countries have decided not to pull it inside the security or an investment protection, investor protection perimeter. Here in the US we have. Jay Clayton, I think rightly, uh, the head of the SEC, has because we have different securities laws in this country. Um, which includes the word investment contract inside the securities laws. So the question is not whether an initial coin offering is a security, is, is it an investment contract? And if it is, then it's a security. So to, the, at the core is, I think most governments, and I would agree with this, feel it's not their job to ban something. It's to say this new technology will be technology neutral. Can we bring it inside the socially accepted parameters of tax law, 
anti-money laundering, investor protection, and the like. So I think we're probably done by this clock, unless you want me to do nope. anything else. Thank you. No, thank you.